Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome back to Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs. Truth and reconciliation. And when we, st- when our government took on this project, there was a lot more to it than just simply saying, I'm sorry for the residential schools. We know it hurt you. And please forgive us. Because... With the indigenous culture and how the structure of 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 uh, the Native American or indigenous American um, or First Nations Canadians, how the societies were set up was not exactly the same as it was for Europe. So. There's a, a lot more to an identity than just meets meets a person. There's a lot more to the culture and how the culture leads back so that it tells the history and the stories of ancestors going back thousands of years. The, the culture didn't just miraculously appear as soon as first contact happened it had been in existence for thousands of years before first contact ever happened and there's evidence to show how ancient the indigenous culture in North America truly is and how by scooping and grabbing children away and other things that happen with residential school and by forcing mass migrations of, of people from off of one piece of land to another piece of land. The, culturally, there's an attachment to that land for that group of people and that attachment becomes part of that person's identity and it needs to be acknowledged there are other things that that go along with with the tr- with those traditions that need to be understood so truth and reconciliation isn't just simply saying acknowledging that something went wrong within the governments of um, first contact that ha- that happened here, and that would also not only include um, the Canadian government, also would include the uh, U.S. government with the, with the same issue. That there's a lot more that leads back thousands of years. There's a lot more that, that than what is that can be done than just saying we're sorry that we scooped and grabbed your children. We're sorry that we chased you off your land. So with that with that there's a lot of healing that needs to happen between Everyone, all groups of people, so that we all can live together in harmony 
and so that we all can live together in protection and reverence to the land that we live on than this planet earth that we live on so that's going to be some of what you're going to hear in this in this next 43 minutes you're also going to hear from uh, david eby murray rankin and as they talk about um how we need to build a society together that is unified with the goals of supporting culture, supporting the land, and making everyone feel as though this land is is all ours. Okay, so let's listen to um, the the ceremony of First Nations leadership gathering as they have their opening remarks that we have already pre-recorded. who my parents are, told you who my grandparents are, because in our way, that information is important, and it's also important for you to know that I know exactly who I am. And I welcomed you to the territory of the Hualmuk people, Hualmuk Stalmuk people, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish nations, thanking all of you for joining us today. We'd like to say good morning and welcome to the seventh BC Cabinet and First Nations gathering. Isn't that amazing? Give yourselves a round of applause. And as I said, I'm Leah George Wilson, Sitia Ama Sialia from Slywatith, and I'll be your MC for the next two days. It's so good to be here in person to see all of you today. It's been a couple of years of all of this virtual kind of meeting, so it's wonderful for us to be in person and fabulous for all of you to be meeting with um, all of the different ministers that you'll be meeting with. We'd like to give greetings to our distinguished and honored guests to be here with all of you, as I said, is just so amazing. I'd like to acknowledge the many elders, First Nations leaders, chiefs and council members that are with us today. And of course, we have the new Premier, David Eby, his cabinet, and the NDP caucus. Premier Eby, for many of us, this is the first time for us to be speaking with you in your new role as Premier. And I'm sure I can speak for all of us in attendance that we all look forward to the discussions in the next couple of days. Like in years past, since 2018, we have again opened the gathering to youth delegates. Can I get um, some hands for the youth delegates that are here? Yes. Their tenacities for our communities helps us to remember how our work, your work, benefits our communities and in the future so our children can be proud of this work. I'd like to also acknowledge the delegates that are joining us virtually on the Feed Loop platform. So give a wave to the ones who are joining us virtually. And of course, wonderful to see all of you who are here in person today. We also have a number of dignitaries joining us. Um, if you want to give a wave when I say your name, MLA's Adam Olson. Adam Olson, Eid Squichel. Sonia Furstenau from the Green Caucus, both are with us. And Michael Lee from the BC Liberal Caucus. We also have officials from Justice Canada and Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada are here as well. 30 organizations have joined us as exhibitors who you can visit in Ballroom A just through this 
opening during this during this um, conference. This gathering, as you may recall, is a partnership between the First Nations Leadership Council and the province of British Columbia. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the executives of the First Nations Leadership Council now. If you wouldn't mind standing, I would appreciate that. The First Nations Summit Executive, Cheryl Casimir, Tanaha First Nation. Robert Phillips, Northern Chequemic to Kalmuk, Shushwak, Canham Lake, First Nation. Hugh Breaker, Sishat, First Nation. From the BC Assembly of First Nations, we have Regional Chief Terry Tiji, Takla, First Nation. From the Union of BC Indian Chiefs Executive, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, Penticton Indian Band. Chief Don Tom, Sartlip, First Nation. And Cookby, Judy Wilson, Nesconleth, Indian Band. And also, I'd like to recognize the co-chairs for the First Nation Summit excuse me, Ray Harris and, well, and me, Leah. We co-chair at the First Nation Summit. I want to recognize me so much as I want to recognize our friend, Ray, who was with us today. And especially, we'd like to acknowledge all of the staff from the First Nations Leadership Council and the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. All who have worked so hard to organize this huge event and are working behind the scenes today and tomorrow, ensuring that things go smoothly. Also, shout out to Pace Group, who are the behind the scenes people. Let's give all of these people a round of applause. <laughs> this year's event is the biggest we've ever had. There are more than 800 face-to-face meetings scheduled to take place over the next two days. Um, I, I heard one First Nation group say they had 14 or 15 meetings in these next two days. I think that is so amazing and I hope that you all have um, good meetings. Delegates have made the journey here from 200 communities and organizations. During the next two days, First Nations and Provincial leaders will meet face-to-face -face and in groups to discuss issues that are critical to all First Nations people and to our, your communities, Indigenous rights, governance, self-determination, and reconciliation. These are four really broad topics, and I know we could easily fill up two days with just one of those topics. Yet we will be touching on all of them because they are all important to all of us collectively in this room. We have a lot to get through and I'd like to invite our, nope, I'm not going to invite them just yet. I am going to welcome Councillor Charlene Alec Tielta, Tieltanot, Simtanot. No, it's a little bit off. Simtonot to come and join us and open our gathering in a good way with a welcome to the territory and a prayer. Heights at Bower, CM and CIA, Simtonot, Quanasqui. Tlitsen at Flowit Old East Alo Tamil Tachiam, Siamalalo Taman Ti Aktana Taten, Ait Tanish Gwaloan Tini Ti. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of uh, our chief at Slowitus, um, Chief Jen Thomas, she sends her regrets. Um, but on behalf of, as well as um, Slowitus, Chief and Council, and I'd like to say our elders and our youth, um, because we always reach back and, and pull the wisdom of our ancestors and our elders and make decisions for our youth and future generations, um, as well as on behalf of Musqueam and Squamish. Um, I come to you with good feelings in my heart to um, 
to have the space uh, for all you, whether you're um, inherent or elected leaders, to come and speak for your people. And may this space um, be a place where our ancestors can come and be, be with you to use your voice for the much needed help that our Khumluk people need back at home, whether it be housing, education, health, or, um, you know, to, to lift the standards of our people. It's all invested in, in your voice. And I just raise my hands to each and every one of you that are here to do so. Thank you for, for all the ministers for, for being here and taking the time to hear our leaders. I'm going to share a song. <clears throat> oh, he Just encouraging you all to um, to have a great few days um, as you gather here today, and just congratulate you all for uh, pulling out those conference wardrobe after a few years of not being together. <laughs> Charlene Alec from the Slaughter Nation for that lovely song and welcome to the territory. Um, I'd like to invite to the stage the following for their opening remarks. Grand Chief Stuart Phillip from the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, Cheryl Casimir, First Nations Summit, uh, Regional Chief Terry Tiji, and uh, Mr. Premier David Eby. Would you please make your way up to the stage. And please note your name cards are, are at your chair. I should let you know while everyone's getting settled is that we are live streaming these opening remarks on the BC government Facebook account. Don't you just love Facebook? And it will be available afterward for those of you that want to watch it again when you get home. Also noting that all of you look great in your official duty clothing that still fits after two years. <laughs> Our first opening speaker is uh, Grand Chief Stuart Philip Asiuth of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. He is a member of the Penticton Indian Band and has been president of the UBCIC for eight terms. He has a long history advocating for the title and rights of Indigenous peoples for all of us, not just his community, for all of us and all of our organizations, 
supporting communities in need. Please welcome Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. Simply good day, my dear friends and relatives. My traditional name is Asiut. And I, it really lifts my spirits to see all of you sitting here together in this room. In every sense of the word, representing the future of our province in terms of true, genuine reconciliation. For those of you that know me, I've always said that reconciliation is not for wimps. And I also say something else. I say BC rocks. Oh, see ya. I am so proud to be from British Columbia. I am so grateful that I can raise my family in a progressive region of this country such as British Columbia. British Columbia historically has always led this country in terms of progressive political, economic, and, and social issues. And we continue to do that. I am, I am so grateful that this is our seventh session. And I think we've moved beyond the eye talk. I think we've moved beyond the flirting. And I think now is the time with the foundation and platform of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act to do some serious work. The heavy lifting is already done. The act has been passed unanimously by both sides of the House. I was there on that historic day. And when the vote was called, I was literally holding my breath. I was praying that it would be unanimous and not split along partisan lines. And it was unanimous. And that was such an unbelievable day, a special moment in the history of the province of British Columbia. I want to express my sincere gratitude to the legions of civil servants, public servants, our technicians, our legal advisors, and all of the scores of people that have been hard at work on dealing with a lot of these issues, such as alignment of laws, to be consistent with the principles and the intent of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I've always believed a rising tide carries all boats. And that is what I see uh, as the future of British Columbia. I want to acknowledge Premier, uh, former Premier Horgan. Uh, he played a major role in bringing us to where we are here today. I'm absolutely thrilled that uh, Premier Eby is now our provincial leader. I've had the privilege and the honor of knowing David for well over 20 years. I've worked with him, I've traveled all over the province with him, and I know he's a good person. And along with uh, the government of British Columbia and the uh, UBCM, for example, and we all pull ourselves together and think about the well-being of our children and grandchildren, work through the difficult issues that have been mentioned. Um, for example, the devastation of the climate crisis where people lost their homes, their businesses, their lands, that we can put our hearts and minds together in a good way 
and make a better place for our grandchildren. And that's essentially what our job is. And I'm so proud to be in the midst of all of you. Uh, many, many of you I know. I know there's hope for reconciliation because my wife and I had lunch with Michael Lee at the White Spot in Penticton, and he paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Lim Lim. <laughs> Our next speaker is Cheryl Casimir Aksmaknik Pitsak Paski of the First Nation Summit. Cheryl is a citizen of the Tanaha Nation and is from the community of Akam, which is located near Cranbrook in the southeastern corner of BC. She is in her fourth term on the First Nation Summit political executive. She has worked throughout her life to address fundamental title and rights issues and has advocated for First Nations issues and inclusiveness of perspectives at all levels. Please welcome Cheryl Casimir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. It's a little bit daunting sitting up here or standing up here and looking into this crowd. It's a huge crowd, but a very handsome, beautiful looking crowd. And it's been a while since we've been able to come together in person and to talk about these many important issues that um, lie in front of us. So I'm really looking forward to the outcome of the discussions. I want to start off by acknowledging that we are standing here on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam peoples. I also want to acknowledge Charlene Alec for the prayer and the beautiful song. That's one of my favorite songs. And so I just wanted to thank you for that. And I also want to, to say to Charlene that I actually I support your comments about the fact that we've had to dust off our conference clothes um, and start to wear them again, I think. Long gone are the days of being able to shut off your camera and sit there in your pajamas and, and do work. I'm going to miss those days. I also want to um, acknowledge the leadership here, um, First Nations leadership, who have taken the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. And I know that you're here because this, this work is really important to you and to your communities, your children and your families. And I want to thank Premier Eby and his cabinet and his leadership for meeting with us for the seventh time for the First Nations Leadership Gathering. We have a lot of work ahead of us. I think it was, well, I don't think, it was three years, three years ago when I had the honor to stand on the floor of the legislature when Bill 41 was being introduced. And that was a historic day, and it's a day that I will never forget. It meant a lot to me because of the hard work that each and every one of us put into that piece of legislation. It was years of work. And I know that there was a bit of fear and trepidation in terms of the unknown and if there was going to be any backlash. And I'm speaking on behalf of the pro provincial governance part. I guess maybe us too. We weren't really sure what this, was, what this really meant. And I think that's why I st stood there and I said, but the sky didn't fall. And it didn't. It hasn't. In fact, what I see is that the skies are starting to clear because we're having a more of a stronger vision in terms of what it is that we want to see, how we want to breathe life into the United Nations Declaration Act, and how we want to implement it within our respective communities. And in order to do that, we have to continue to do that in partnership between ourselves and with the provincial government. We have had to undertake a lot of transformative change, though, over this past few years. Um, we're trying to change archaic and colonial institutions and structures that really never had the space for us Indigenous peoples to be there as partners and decision makers sitting alongside them. We've also had to do a lot of this work through a global pandemic and through a series of consecutive climate crises. And I think that what we have learned from that, those crises, is that our land, 
Mother Earth can no longer sustain an exploitive economy. We need to work on changing how we treat the land. If we want the land to be here for our future generations, the way that we've been operating and, and so-called managing the land isn't sustainable. And I know that climate crisis is a huge priority for First Nations. We talked about this in our caucus yesterday, among a, among a range of other priority issues. And Premier Eby and ministers, I'm sure that you're going to be hearing directly from the leadership here today through your 20-minute sessions about what those priorities are and how they impact us and what we need to see to change. Um, I had a whole bunch of things that I was going to say, but I think I've said enough. Um, we have a long day ahead of us, and I just wanted to say that I want to wish each and every one of you success. I know 20 minutes is not a long time, but from what I've learned and from what I've seen, we organize ourselves properly, we strategize properly, and we can maximize that time effectively, and we'll be able to go home, hopefully, with some strong plans in place to change the circumstances of our lives and our communities for our children and our families. So I wish you all a very good, productive next two days. Taha. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the table, to the podium, or if he's going to stay there, our next speaker is Regional Chief Terry Tiji of the BC Assembly of First Nations. Terry is a member of the Takla Lake First Nations. He is in his second term as Regional Chief for BC AFN. He has a deep understanding and involvement in natural resource development and policies. Always says he's a recovering uh, registered professional forester. He has worked to unify and support people working towards the recognition of our inherent rights and title. Please welcome Regional Chief Terry Tiji. Thank you, Leah. Deniza, Tsekuza, Skyza. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sabertooth, and, and thank you for the opening, the, the song. Uh, delegates, chiefs, hereditary chiefs, leadership, youth, elders, residential school survivors, intergenerational survivors. It's really a pleasure to, to come and meet after two years of living through the pandemic. Whoever thought we would have canceled meetings on March 11th and sent everybody home and our world changed. And what the pandemic did was really expose the shortcomings of our, of our relationships, of, of government, of our healthcare system. The issues of the, not only the healthcare system, but also what we were experiencing even before the pandemic, the opioid crisis and homelessness. Certainly many of these issues were brought forward yesterday in the caucus room with our chiefs and we do have an open letter to you, uh, Premier Eby. I also want to recognize, uh, I was hoping a former Premier would be here, John Horgan, and recognize his leadership and his many years. Uh, certainly when I met him many, many years ago as part of um, you know, some of the work I was doing for my nation, Tactile Nation, fighting for Amaze Lake. There was John Horgan, Scott Fraser, Doug Donaldson, Shane Simpson. They all became part of, of the, the previous administration and now they've moved on to pass their, their, their um, uh, public life or political life to, to other things in, in their private life. So I want to thank them for the work that they did many, many years ago. And as I worked for my community and my tribal council in those years, in 04, 05, uh, before I, I ran for chief, I, I did have the opportunity of, of first meeting uh, our now Premier Eby when he used to work for Pivot Legal and also for Civil Liberties because of the issues that we were experiencing of our Indigenous peoples with the RCMP and Prince George. So certainly the assistance and help that you brought forward back then, we're looking forward to, to now. As many of you are in this room, we heard some of your priorities yesterday and I'm certain that you'll bring those forward with your many, many meetings that are scheduled in the next couple of days. 
But as we met and, and you know many of the conversations that I had with um, uh, then his uh, lawyer life, uh, uh, Premier Eby, we finally got an opportunity to, to meet uh, in a room and physically and I realized how short I was and um, standing and <laughs> literally looking up to him, I realized, okay, I'm not that tall. I'm not that tall and, and certainly does take a tall person physically and perhaps uh, figuratively to, to become uh, a leader of this place that, that really rocks British Columbia. Uh, last couple of weeks has been um, terrible on my sleep as I did have the opportunity to represent the Assembly of First Nations at the Conference of the Parties 27 on climate change. And I had the opportunity to speak to um, uh, the uh, President Lula from Brazil and many Indigenous peoples who looked at us as Canada as a beacon of light, of leadership. We passed the United Nations Declaration Act. But who's the shining star out of Canada? It's British Columbia. As we celebrate three years yesterday, as I stood with my colleagues from the Leadership Council in the legislature of passing Bill C-41. And certainly the, the journey hasn't been easy. There's been setbacks. But as Grand Chief said last week at, at the meetings on child welfare, and the amendments came through, which is great to take over jurisdiction, there's no turning back. There's no turning back. We're moving ahead. And whether we do have some shortcomings on, on some of our relationships, we're still moving forward with our relationship with the provincial government, and that's a good thing. And certainly with my other colleagues from, from other provinces here in, in Canada, they're looking to us. They're looking to British Columbia for leadership. They're looking to British Columbia to develop, which is my file, a national action plan to implement the declaration, Bill C-15. And certainly we do have that experience here in British Columbia as we do have the 89 commitments on, on our action plan. We have five years and to align many of the colonial laws with the United Nations Declaration. I wish you well on many of your meetings. And just a note to that, as I said yesterday, if there's anything concerning to you and anything that you need help with to push uh, forward on, on some of your agenda items, let us know at the FNLC so we can push too and help you in any of these, uh, these very important matters. And one of the things I, as, as Leah, stated, I am a recovering forester, <laughs> and forestry has been, and, and this is to Minister Conroy, has been a very difficult one to align the laws with. It, has, it was a part of the commitment document that was signed in 2016. It was environmental assessment, child welfare, and forestry. I've been banging at the table for, for the last uh, several years on forestry and there hasn't been enough movement. There has been challenges and we need to get moving on, on aligning Forest Range and Practices Act and Forestry Act. So thank you and, and wish you well. Merci. Thank you, Regional Chief. Our last speaker is BC's Premier, the Honourable David Eby. David Eby is the elected MLA for the riding of Vancouver Point Grey. He was first elected to the provincial government legislature in 2013 and has been re-elected three times. Previous to becoming an MLA, he was an award-winning human rights lawyer. Now, he is the new Premier and the President of the Executive Council. This is his first time addressing the BC Cabinet and First Nations leaders gathering. I'd also like to say that we had the honour to see uh, Premier Eby sworn in at Musqueam Cultural Centre using not only the ceremony and the pomp and circumstance of the legislature, but also the ceremony of our Hualmuk people the ceremony of Musqueam. We heard Musqueam language. We saw 
Hualmok ceremony. And I must say, Mr. Premier, that did a lot for our First Nations community because we could see ourselves, and for that, we raised our hands. Let's give a warm welcome to Premier Eby. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Leah, for that kind introduction. And let me join in uh, recognizing the territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people and, uh, and uh, express my appreciation for the welcoming song. Uh, starting us off in a good way. Um, it, it was fun to hear the regional chiefs uh, um, reminiscing about our old days. He was a young go-getter. His hair was a different color. At, uh, <laughs> coming out of Carrier Sakani and uh, when we worked together. Um, and uh, I was a baby lawyer working in the downtown east side. Uh, it was a different time. I mean, Grand Chief, uh, you'll remember that as well. You were basically the same uh, <laughs> uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Unchanged, as far as I can tell. Uh, still the Grand Chief, uh, still looking great. And, uh, and, um, and uh, Cheryl, uh, working with the summit over the years, it's been, uh, it's been a real journey. And I uh, know for myself, I never imagined to be in this position of being the Premier of British Columbia. It's a great honor for me. And, uh, and I'm almost certain that everybody at this table never imagined that either. But here we are, right? <laughs> So, uh, so let's get some good work done. I uh, uh, am really excited that we're all together. We, uh, we've been held off uh, by pandemic and by floods. Uh, and, uh, and during the time since we last gathered, um, we've had tragedy. Uh, the uh, the uh, revelations about, obviously, uh, the, the kids who didn't come home from residential school. Uh, shocking to many people in Canada. Uh, and grief across the nation. Um, the uh, ongoing tragedy and grief of the murdered and missing Indigenous women. Um, but we've had moments of hope too. Uh, and I want to take a moment to reflect on the contributions of my predecessor, uh, Premier John Horgan. You've heard it uh, from uh, many of the speakers here. I know I have, uh, as I say, a big Doc Martens to fill. Uh, the Premier um, showing leadership out of the gate on the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, BC, the first province in Canada uh, to recognize and to put into law the Declaration to give it meaning with an independent secretariat and an action plan. How we're actually going to turn this from words on paper into change that you can see and feel and touch in your communities. Um, I know from my work way back when uh, that trust is earned. Uh, it's not given. And it's my intention as Premier to earn the trust uh, that you gave to Premier John Horgan. I'm here to listen uh, and to learn. And I know that I'm not doing my job if I'm not delivering for people. Uh, and we can only do that by listening and partnering in the work together. Um, one of the ways that I want to um, make sure that we're delivering for you uh, on the ground in your communities uh, is to share with you that um, I will be uh, establishing in the Premier's office a role of special counsel to the Premier on Indigenous reconciliation. Uh, many of you in the room will know Doug White, uh, former Chief uh, Slanamo First Nation, uh, negotiator, lawyer, um, did uh, amazing work with Lake Babine. Um, he, uh, he recently was co-chair of the First Nations Justice Council, where I first met him. And uh, together, we partnered on delivering the First Nations Justice Strategy, resulting in Indigenous justice centers being established in many parts of the province, uh, and leading to our recent announcement of an expansion of 10 additional Indigenous justice centers. Um, Doug, being in the Premier's office, uh, will assist me, will assist government in delivering for your communities on the ground. Many of the issues that I've heard about, I uh, was Attorney General, uh, and many of you met with me in that role. Um, many of the issues that I heard about in those rooms crossed over multiple ministries. You know, you have two, three, four provincial ministries, as well as the federal government, and you're trying to just deal with an issue in your community that has been a long-standing irritant. We are committed to the action plan. 
We are committed to the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, the big picture things, the foundational work we have to do to work together. Um, but we also have to be committed to the issues that you see in your community that just need to be addressed, that are signs to the people who live, in, to your constituents, to the people you represent, that government is listening and taking action. And so to help negotiate through all those different ministries to get results for you on the ground, uh, Doug will be instrumental. And Doug's legal background obviously will also be a great assistance to me as well. You know, I, I, uh, I'm so excited about uh, the work that we've done to date. Um, and I understand we need to do more. Uh, we need to use the uh, tools that we have, the Section 6 and 7 agreements, like uh, we reached with the Taltan, um, uh, foundational agreements, treaty, um, a new fiscal framework to make sure that you have the revenue. Governments need revenue to look after their constituents. I recognize that that is critical. The new f fiscal framework will support self-determination to achieve a province-wide future where First Nations are are the active leaders, where it, through self-determination, you are guiding your own communities to prosperity uh, and to success for your people. I, uh, I am uh, really hopeful for uh, the future that we're going to build together in the province. I got two little kids. I got a three-year-old and an eight-year-old. Uh, my eight-year-old goes to Norma Rose Point School, uh, and uh, he, uh, he learns at that school about the Musqueam people. It's a big part of uh, the education. Norma Rose was a Musqueam uh, elder and a leader in community, and he comes home and he tells me all about the Musqueam people. Uh, and uh, he was really excited about the swearing in that was going to be at Musqueam. Uh, and that event, it changed me forever. It was such an amazing uh, event. And I'll be, uh, I will always uh, do my best to be uh, as forthcoming as possible with you. The reason why it was at Musqueam is because Government House was booked with a, a fundraiser, okay? <laughs> so Government House wasn't available, but sometimes life is like that. You know, you get a setback, it's like, what? We can't book a Government House, seriously? Like, it's not, okay, it's fine. Uh, what are we gonna do? It has to be in the community. And, uh, and called uh, Chief Wayne Sparrow and said, can we do it? Uh, can, can you host us at Musqueam? and the chief and council made the decision that we could, and it was such an amazing event. Um, it, was a, it was a combination of, uh, of Musqueam uh, tradition uh, and, uh, and ceremony, and the lieutenant governor swore me in, uh, and it was, uh, in the words of a witness, um, that uh, a friend of mine who came forward, you know, it, it was, it was an, expression of tradition of working together uh, and it was very meaningful but for my son you know he saw the Musqueam warrior dancers come in um, he saw his dad get blanketed um, he saw uh, the lieutenant governor do the swearing in that is something that will um, stay with him for his whole life he saw a $100 rebate on BC Hydro bills for every British Columbia. Um, this is a special, special day for him, for many families across the province. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you for being here. I know many of you uh, came a long distance uh, for these meetings. Uh, my colleagues, uh, cabinet ministers, MLAs are here. Uh, we are all working together to build the province. Uh, that we know British Columbia can be, and we can only do it together, and events like this make it possible. So thank you for your efforts in being here. I really look forward to our meetings today. Thanks very much. Protection of, of our culture and our traditions is, or at least it should be, a human right. And we do a lot of broadcasting here to, to protect human rights or to, or to point out that, hey, Maybe you violated someone's human rights. So we thank you for listening to today's programming. And we hope that you actually learned something. At this time, we're also going to ask you to find that subscribe button wherever you may have it. Uh, depending, it's in different places, depending on the platform that you, that you are listening to us on. 
and click it right now so that you can get more of this programming and help us spread the word that we need to be respectful, loveful, and supportive of every human being on this planet. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.